Okay, my apologies. To the oh, board. it's okay. We all have problems like this sometimes. We now seem to have lost Judge Ant, uh, Judge Atkinson's camera. Up oh, there, he is coming in. I think there he is. <laughs> yeah, early, I don't know if you know Judge Atkinson didn't have his blue background, so <laughs> now he does. Okay, we're ready. All right. Yes, Your Honor. Okay, Mr. Solomon, you're up. Thank you, Your Honor. May it please the court, I'd like to save uh, five minutes from my rebuttal. May it please the court. Uh, I have the pleasure of representing Marina Bay, who is the purchaser of this property, uh, but interestingly, not the adjacent property. We contracted with the seller to purchase the property and to close on after the extensions were granted on May 26th. On May 17th of 2017, we delivered uh, all of the closing documents to the title company and to the seller. On May 24th, uh, being a good developer, the purchaser uh, asked for an extension of time, but the extension of time not being granted uh, for the closing. Uh, on May 25th, before even allowing the closing to, uh, to the closing date to come on May 26th, the seller adjourned the closing purportedly pursuant to paragraph eight of the agreement for 30 days. Uh, but it wasn't for 30 days because they just adjourned the closing and that eliminated the need for the tender. What I'd Mr. like to do Solomon, is- Mr. Solomon, th this, this occurred on the heels of your client requesting an extension, another extension of up to eight months. Yes, sir. We only asked, there's a contract provision that says no modifications and are not in writing. We never indicated in the desire or an intention not to close. The closing documents had been already been prov provided and uh, uh, reviewed, and uh, we there was no indication that any modification of the contract with a full integration clause and no modification clause was ever modified or changed. We were ready but to on, close. On, on either date that you mentioned, your client apparently was not ready, willing, and able to close. Well, I don't know. Apparently, there, that's a factual issue at best because the affidavit, the declaration signed and filed by Reza Yazdani, the principal of the purchaser, clearly indicates how, when, why, and where he was ready to close. And that was not refuted. It was only refuted, yes, this, or, if you will. So, uh, the, yeah, what if I concede that, that they're ready, willing, and able to close and they had, they had the funds and all? Um, one way of looking at that is, of course they are, because the only the only condition precedent that hadn't been met didn't benefit the buyer. It benefited the seller. It was for the seller's benefit. So uh, one way of looking at this is the, the purchaser can say all day long, I, we were ready, willing, and able to close. Uh, uh, of course, because I could just infer from that that they don't care whether the condition precedent that benefited the seller had been, had, had, had been fulfilled. But even if they were ready, willing, and able to close then wh why isn't the seller still permitted to say, I, I don't, I don't want to go to closing without these protections, without, without the protection that I bargained for, that the, uh, that the, that the, that the, the development would be legally conforming. And well, then don't they have the right under the contract that, that the purchaser entered into to, to retain the, um, the deposits at that point? Well, you've asked a, a series of questions. I'll address the last one first just to, to talk about it, if it was a default by a failure of a covenant to occur, then it had to be noticed pursuant to section 11.3. And 11.3 required an opportunity to cure because the reason for which they purportedly tanked the contract was because they said so does that the it have condition to be a covenant or, or, is, or, is or is it you cannot go to closing without this condition present to closing? It explicitly says condition present to, precedent to closing. It says condition precedent, but it is not an enforceable condition precedent under the law because a, a courts will not grant or recognize something as a condition precedent unless the condition precedent is clear and unambiguous and uh, or that they're required by the plain uh, language of the circumstances or by necessity and implication. Now, there wasn't anything here. This was a, a request to satisfy a, something for the benefit of the affiliate, 
of the facility owner, the adjacent property was not what was the subject of this transaction. It didn't affect this particular transaction in the, for the sale of the property for the construction of this tower and the parking facility. And that but, you know, but, 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 you know, but the contract said that this deal is contingent, right, on that. Well, it doesn't really say that. It says, it says the condition preceding is we need to have the assurance from the government that that the remaining parcel will be uh, compliant. Well, but whose obligation was that to accomplish? If Whatever we obligation, get... whoever's obligation it is. Well, even, sounds like you just jumped issues, if, though. Even if it had said specifically it is the seller's obligation to obtain this assurance and it's still not obtained, how is this still not a condition precedent? They can't, it may be under the circumstances a condition precedent if it was sufficiently clear and unambiguous or by necessity required. Neither is true. But if we go down that path, I mean, why would these people sell that property to your client and then have their own use of the property they retain now, uh, you know, uh, shut down? We don't have, we don't know that. We don't know that it was shut down. We don't, we don't know, know that, but we know that they were concerned about that risk. But we don't know what the what the letter regarding legal conforming would mean. That can't possibly be something that was charged to us because it would just leave it a, a, a wide open for them to say anything about that. If they do nothing, zero, they make zero effort to satisfy that. And the record is clear. They made no effort, made no recognition of their obligation well, until August 28th. Well, of course, this is, you are characterizing it as their obligation and the judge found to the contrary Well, in his interpretation found, of the agreement. Well, but that's without any basis because there's nowhere in the contract that says or even suggests that it's the obligation of the purchaser. In section 4.1, it doesn't say who is to satisfy the condition precedent, whether it's an affirmative, it, it doesn't say whether it's an affirmative obligation to anyone to discharge the condition precedent in section 4.1, because let's look at what the judge relied on to determine that it was the purchaser's uh, condition precedent to satisfy. That was only because of the language in section 4.1. That's it. There's no fact, there's no testimony, there's no document, that shows that the reasons that they that they are right in their mind and in the judge's mind for that it was Marina Bay's obligation is only the language of section 4.1. But section 4.1 doesn't indicate what they were supposed to do or how it was supposed to be. It was the statement of an intention to develop a property and doesn't say what that would be. We don't know what the obligations were to satisfy that condition precedent. And if the seller wanted that, they had to specify what needed to be done in order to accomplish it. We don't even know what the legal nonconformity was. There were at least two different descriptions in the various reports that were provided, at least two different descriptions of what it was. One was because it was the, the parcels were, were not properly identified for ad valorem tax purposes. And another was because uh, there was some development issue, but we don't know what that was. The seller, it's whatever it was, was uniquely within the power and knowledge and control of the seller and its affiliate to effectuate the desired confirmation. If, if, if the, it was the owner of the affected parcel and its affiliate that owned all of the rest of the property, the owner holds all the cards when it comes to the zoning, if this was a, 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 an imprecise and effectively mythical condition precedent, that shouldn't be enforced because what happens is that gives them the opportunity just not to do anything and keep my $300,000. Is this, is this an argument that was in the briefs that, that this was mythical, that the, that, the, that the actual condition precedent was mythical? Yes, because they had no terms of what that was. There are no. Well, I, terms. I, I read the briefs, and I don't. I, I I think I remember a lot of argument that it was the seller is not the purchaser's obligation to fulfill the proceeding. But I've not. I've not. Uh, I've not yet. I don't recall the argument that it was illusory and it was too vague and nebulous. It, and not to mention that 
I know parole evidence shouldn't be uh, used to uh, construe the document itself, but there's a lot of evidence that the parties, uh, given the the the, uh, the correspondence I read, were were pretty. They didn't seem confused as to what they what what needed to happen. Oh, I beg uh, to differ. Governing I, authority. I beg to differ. That first of all, that was all after the closing date. The the letters you're talking about are all post. May 26th, that's number one. And number two, we did say that it, that it was not clear and unequivocal as to what had to happen. That was the argument that we made in the brief. I'm embellishing now only to say, well, wait a minute, we don't know anything about what needed to happen. The, ex the exhibits that, are attacked, that were, were referenced in the argument that specifically talk about what the obligations were, don't specify any of those obligations as to how that's going to be. For example, who, who is going to pay for the whatever the remediation is? How is that going to happen? Who's going to sign the applications just to, to move forward with those obligations? Again, I, I'm not following your argument. Are you now saying it's un, unenforceably vague or something? I, th I don't think there is a condition. I, I, don't see, I don't remember that argument being made. Where, where in your briefs is that argument made? Well, my, my argument is either it's their obligation to satisfy it, or it was not a, a it was so obscure and unclear that it was not a condition precedent. Either but way. Doesn't the fact, Mr. Solomon, doesn't the fact that uh, the seller said that it would assist your client in providing whatever paperwork needed to be done? That's not what it with, says. With, with, with the understanding that it would not cost them anything. Yeah, that's an that interesting point. That suggests the burdens on your client. That, that's an interesting point. That's not the proper reading, I suggest, of that second portion of that paragraph. What they were going to do was to, to assign on to the approval of the PD, of the application for the, for the, the development of the plan development. That's is, is it that, that is were... it that is it so explicit that it was limited in that way? Y yes, I believe it is, Your Honor, because it says the approval, the language. This contract's a mess. We can agree on that, but at least with respect to ten point ten point four, it said it talks about the approval. The approval that they they are to uh, the purchaser is seeking the approval under four point one for the its development. And the seller has to cooperate with that development on the property. That's what that, that second portion of 4.1 relates to. Seller consents and agrees to cooperate with the purchaser in seeking such approval. That approval relates to the development of the multifamily residential building. Because that's what it says when the, the, if that happens, if they join on and the closing doesn't take place, they don't want it to adversely affect their property. That would be the zoning approval. That's not with respect to the adjacent parcel, the adjacent property. That section 4.1 was used by the trial judge for two reasons. The reason that you just cited, Judge LaRose, and also to suggest that, the, that it was somehow a requirement imposed upon the buyer, the purchaser in this case. And there's no such language. It says that the the purchaser intends to require the approval of, of the various governmental entities of such planned development of the property. That approval of the, of the, that talks about in the second portion of that paragraph is that approval, not the approval that it was, that the adjacent property was legal non-conforming. That's two completely separate issues. And that's what the judge did. He collapsed or those two concepts and said that the second sentence somehow relates to the first, but the first sentence was disjointed because it doesn't say or even suggest that the purchaser was going to accomplish that. And the purchaser was going to take all of the risk that the approval wasn't granted pursuant to the agreement, whatever approval that was. They already had $300,000 at risk. That's alone enough of an incentive for them to try and, and close the deal. So the, the, the mythical portion of it is they didn't bother to, to address Judge Atkinson's question a little bit more specifically. They said they could hold, uh, if their interpretation is true, they could just not do anything and hold my $300,000. That can't be 
the basis for this. They do nothing. They don't describe what has to be done. They don't explain how it has to be done. There's no specific language in the agreement that says I have to do it. And if they don't do anything, a lot of my case depends upon their failure to do anything with respect to this covenant. I'm, I'm sorry, with respect to this condition that they said that they needed is, their, is the end of their case. What I'd like to talk a, a little bit about before I run out of time is, is the issue of what damage is. Speaking of which, you're, you're coming into your rebuttal time, Mr. Solomon. You, you use your minutes as you please. I wanted to talk for a moment about the issue associated with the, the damages. First of all, Section 11.2, it, it clearly says that it's exclusive. Section 11.1 is not exclusive. And the point I'd like to make in particular with that is that, that the only defaults that are governed by 11.1 are the fact that any or are if any of the seller's representations or warranties are false, they fail to deliver the closing documents in a timely manner, or they create an impermissible, impermissible encumbrance. Their adjournment and just tanking the contract is not one of those issues that's wrapped within section 11.1, even if it were to be interpreted to be exclusive. Thank you, I'll reserve the rest of my time. Okay, thank you, you have about four minutes. Okay, Mr. Gerland. Yes, good morning, can, can the court hear me? Okay, thank you very much. Uh, may it please the court, Harvey Gerland for the appellee, and with me is my colleague, Julian Jackson Fannin. Um, I'll refer to the appellee as ARHC, which is, how it's been referred to in uh, the briefs and in the record below. It's also referred to um, as the seller. Uh, this is a case dealing with one claim, which is a claim for anticipatory repudiation of a real estate sales agreement between Marina Bay and ARHC. I'd like to just first focus on some questions the court had, and I think uh, the court was correct in focusing on uh, a question, was Marina Bay ready, willing, and able to close in May 2017 or September 2017? In connection with that, I would also like to point out that the parties stipulated uh, that the agreement was clear and unambiguous. This notion today about myths and mythical language is not something that was argued before. It was. It is contrary to a stipulation that was reached on the record at the summary judgment proceedings, and it was set forth in the written opinion by Judge Ramsberger, where he uh, focused on the agreement is unambiguous, it will be interpreted according to Florida law, which you look at the plain meaning, you look at the entirety of the, of the agreement, not just focusing on one phrase or one section of the agreement. And the court, the, the trial level, uh, did not rely on parole evidence. No parole evidence was submitted by either side regarding how the agreement should be interpreted because both sides said, it is to be interpreted by the plain and ordinary meaning of the language. Now, the court was asking questions uh, about was Marina Bay ready, willing, and able to close? And the law on anticipatory repudiation, and this is from the Florida Supreme Court uh, in hospital mortgage, and this court in the Ryan v. Landsource holding case made it very clear that if a party seeks a, a claim for anticipatory repudiation, an essential element of the case is that that party provide evidence that it was ready, willing, and able to close at the time of the breach. And the undisputed facts here show that Marina Bay failed to meet that burden and therefore summary judgment was properly entered. Uh, the court, uh, and, and I'm not sure if the court mentioned the date, but there is the pre-closing date 
email from the principal of uh, Marina Bay. And he says, among other things, quote, me and my investors are ready to buy your land and close on that as soon as we have something approved by the city, unquote. And it goes on, quote, we need to have something approved by the city, unquote. So they asked for an additional eight months to put off the closing, and that was not agreed to. The agreement did not provide for a closing to take place in January of 2018. In, and then at that time in uh, May, the, uh, the, the seller, ARHC, sends a written notice of failure of condition precedent to uh, Marina Bay. Time goes on and in late August, Marina Bay had still not advised that it was ready, willing and able to close. Uh, and I would also point out, again, this is undisputed. They provided a letter, which is supposed to be a loan commitment letter and in support of their position uh, that they were ready, willing and able to close. The letter, which is at uh, record 1146, and I believe it's 1149, and it goes back a few pages as well, makes clear that it was contingent. The letter said it was subject to underwriting. It said it was subject to an appraisal, and it said that it expired on June 5th, 2017. There's no evidence after that that they had this uh, funding from a lender uh, in order to show that they were ready, willing, and able to close. They were not, and they never were. I would, let me also, uh, let me also just mention that because council did, that they submitted a declaration say they wanted to close. Whether they wanted to close or not is not the issue. Uh, the issue is whether they had evidence that they were ready, willing, and able to close. Uh, their desire is what the Supreme Court of the United States, which is now the, the standard that we have in Florida, is conjecture, speculation. That is not enough to deny uh, summary judgment here to ARHC, nor is it enough to give summary judgment to Marina Bay. I'd now like to, because there was a discussion about the condition proceeding. And I think that uh, first, let me point out that filed with the um, summary judgment papers by, Mar by Marina Bay is a zoning report. It's at record uh, site 1492. And the zoning report says that there is a non-conformity and the non-conformity on the existing, uh, what's called the adjacent property, which is an assisted living facility, was density and a height non-conformity. And because the adjacent parcel and the parcel being sold were combined as a subdivision, if there were any changes, it would require a variance for the assisted living facility in order to meet code. That's in the record. That was filed by Marina Bay as part of the papers and considered by Judge Ramsberger. So it's very clear that there was a zoning issue. And it is also very clear in 10.4D uh, in, in that a condition of the obligation of ARHC to deliver title was written confirmation from the governmental authority that the zoning issue had been resolved and the assisted living facility was legally conforming with zoning law. Until that happened, there was no obligation by ARHC, the seller, to deliver title and close. The next question is, well, who had the obligation to do that? Judge Ramsberger correctly concluded 
That was the obligation of Marina Bay, the purchaser. And what he did was he went and looked at section 4.1 because section 4.1 references 10.4D, the condition. And 4.1 says prior to closing, which counsel for the uh, appellant tried to say that meant something other than before closing, but prior to closing only means one thing, before. Marina Bay intends to seek approval of its project and will require approval. This is before closing. Will require approval of various government entities and the satisfaction of the seller contingency in section 10.4D. It goes on in this section to say seller consents, seller will cooperate as long as seller is not going to incur additional uh, expenses and this will not affect seller's use of the property. That construction of looking at both sections together because that's how you interpret a contract and this court of course knows that uh, leads to the conclusion, the correct conclusion that this obligation to satisfy the contingency was the obligation of Marina Bay, not ARHC. Uh, I would also like to um, point out because there was a question or some discussion about the damages. Uh, Florida law is settled. Damage provisions do not have to be identical. And language does not have to be identical. The important point is that the uh, remedies have to be that both sides have remedies in the event of a breach by the other side. In other words, it can't be heads I win, tails you lose. There has to be a remedy. And it is also settled law including from the coastal computer decision, which is from the second uh, DCA, that uh, parties have the contractual right to select the remedies that will be available for a breach. And that's exactly what happened here. So in fact, it says that, and this is in 11.1, it's very clear. If the seller, ARHC, fails to deliver the closing documents, meaning fails to give title, that's one of the defined closing documents, then Marina Bay shall be entitled to either terminate the agreement and get back the deposit or sue for specific performance. That phrase, shall be entitled, is a limitation on the remedy. And that is something that this court in coastal computer ruled that when there is a term that says a party in, a, in its remedies shall be entitled, that's a word of limitation. And here it goes on to say, you got choice A or choice B, not C, D, or anything else. It does not provide that your remedies include, but are not limited to, or your remedies are among other things, which is what the, uh, what Marina Bay is trying to do in rewriting the damage clause. It is very clear, it is unambiguous, and it is settled Florida law that this is a clause of limitation. They had those remedies, they did not do that. Instead, they came with a claim for anticipatory repudiation, claiming that they're entitled to actual damages and disregard what is set forth in section 11.1. Uh, finally, I would, um, and I'm not sure if I have uh, any additional time left, I apologize to the court. You have about uh, seven and a half minutes left, Mr. Garland. Oh, okay. Uh, I don't think I'll take that, uh, Your Honor, but let me just also mention this issue about um, notice of a default. Uh, 
there was no default by Marina Bay. Marina Bay simply didn't satisfy a condition preceding that it was obligated to fulfill in order for the seller, ARHC, to be obligated to deliver title. That's not a default. That is a failure to provide a contingent proceeding. So there was no requirement that ARHC give notice and a 30-day opportunity to cure. But the record shows, and it's undisputed, that actually ARHC gave notice of failure of condition proceeding in May after there was this request uh, for more time and the statement that we're not closing until we have something approved by the city on the project. We'll get back to you later about that. Then the, the seller, ARHC, sends a document. It is called Notice of Failure of Condition Proceeding. They had plenty of time after that, and that was in May, and nothing happened by, uh, by Marina Bay. Also, Marina Bay was never ready, willing, and able to close. As I talked earlier uh, about, they said they're not closing. They're not going to close until their project has been approved. Uh, they didn't have the financing. It expired June 5th. Uh, the financing that they uh, claim to have had was in any event, it was all contingent upon an appraisal, uh, underwriting. No information was ever submitted by uh, Marina Bay in order to substantiate that it had that funding because it didn't, it had expired. Uh, finally, I would just also point out there was an issue about a parking easement. A parking easement was required for uh, the closing. There was a draft parking easement that was uh, provided uh, in the middle of May before the statement by uh, Marina Bay that it wasn't going to close. There was a draft. There were comments back to the draft over the course of time. And, and there's a document and it's got all kinds of red lines with changes to the parking easement. So the parking easement was never finalized. It was a requirement for the obligation of, uh, of uh, ARHC, the seller, to close. So I think it is abundantly clear for all of these reasons, as well as those that we put in our brief, as well as all of the um, uh, findings and conclusions uh, by Judge Ramsberger that the decision should be affirmed that uh, Marina Bay's summary judgment motion was properly denied and ARHC's summary judgment motion was properly granted in accordance with the standards, the new standards, following the U.S. Supreme Court holdings of Celotex and others. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. May it please the court. This issue of the commitment expiring after the scheduled closing date is nothing but a red herring. We have to keep it in context. The affidavit is, is a competent, substantial evidence that the loan and the financing was in place and the closing could take place. His parsing of that to say that somehow his conjecture that that loan commitment was not ready to fund, notwithstanding the acceptance of the commitment and the identification of the readiness to close is, is purely outside of the record. That gets con purely conjecture. With respect to the, the I issue of the parking, uh, uh, of parking easement, uh, paragraph three of the purchase agreement has all of the terms that are necessary. On May 17th, we sent them the parking easement that complied to the letter precisely with the parking easement that was specified in paragraph three of the contract. They just elected to make other changes that they were not authorized to make. There was no agreement 
that they had to get to indicate or to give us in order to have a parking easement. That parking easement was already all cleared up in paragraph three of the contract. All they needed was a recordable document. It was provided on May 17th. Judge Atkinson, to address your question of where I said that it was, uh, it was obscure and there wasn't anything, it's page 27 of my brief. And where I cite the fourth DCA cases, there are second DCA cases, the language isn't quite as precise, <coughs> but in Riley and Lake County and Land Company of Osceola County that we cite there, the conditions precedent are not favored and the courts will not construe precision provisions to be such conditions precedent unless required to do so by the plain unambiguous language or by necessary implication. And there was none here. The problem with this didn't case... Did it say condition precedent and didn't it say prior to closing? No, it didn't say prior to closing anywhere. Prior to closing was applicable to the application in 4.1 for a PD, for the plan development. That's it. That's the only thing the plan... He's taking that clause, which is what he convinced Judge Ramsberger to do, and move it around where it's suited. There is prior to closing, he's going to apply for this thing and uh, then he will require it. Doesn't say prior to closing. It doesn't say that he will do it. it. And that's a condition. Even if it were a condition, if it was my condition, I could waive it. I was ready to close. I don't care about that. Where Judge Northcutt well, started. That's really what it comes down to, right? I mean, it, even if we leave aside the uh, willingness to close, I mean, this is about uh, ability to close. And even if you leave aside the inability to close as being argued by the appellee with regard to uh, funds of availability of funds, you know, it, it, are, you a, are you able to close if a condition precedent, if in fact this court construes the, the, the agreement as the trial court did? Is your part, was your party able to close if there's a condition precedent unmet that it was the obligation of the purchaser to fulfill? Well, if it was my obligation, I don't see anywhere in this contract that it says that it was my obligation and the bootstrapping of section 4.1 to translate section 10.4D is impermissible interpretation of 10.4D because nowhere does it say that. And we all go through all the arguments as to why 10.4D, this, condi this alleged condition precedent is, is applicable or and in our position is inapplicable. Under the circumstances, I have to rely upon the fact that it was either specious, it was not an enforceable condition precedent, but if you say that it's condition precedent, then it was clearly there within their control. There was nothing that I could do to solve that problem for them without their participation and their complete abject failure to participate at all eliminated the need to satisfy that condition precedent if I give it up. Is that, is that what the record, is that what the record um, reflects? A complete abject failure on the part of the but seller? Yes, there's not, they did zero. That, well, with my words, I, I, obviously I understand you're, you're, you're not in, favorable to my position, but they, they, whether I characterize it that way or just say there was a complete absence of any indication whatsoever that they did anything. And Mr. Solomon, your, your time is up. So. All right. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you both. Thank you both very much. Uh, in order to uh, leave the virtual courtroom and go off into the ether, you click the leave button that is on the screen. <laughs>